Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. And in today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Rob Markey. He is a partner at Bain & Company, and he's also the creator of the Net Promoter System that helps companies measure and manage customer loyalty. His mission is to help companies become and remain truly customer-centric. And he has also been called the Vince Lombardi of customer loyalty. Welcome, Rob. How are you? Hey, Darshan. It's nice to meet you. So tell me, Rob, your, about your journey that, uh, along with some of the aha moments you've had, that have brought to where you are now. I, um, you know, I didn't, I certainly didn't set out to have the career that I have. I, that was not my goal when I, uh, when I started out. I, I think I thought I was going to be like the CEO of a big company or something. And, um, it was kind of what I had aspired to. Um, and the way that that all played out was that when I was, uh, graduating from college, I got a job at a company called LexisNexis, which way back in the eighties was, you know, sort of a precursor to what, you know, we know now as Google, like in the sense that not that, not that it has anything to do with Google, but it was, you know, before there was an internet, it was a gigantic searchable database of the law and news and things like that. And the business model depended on um, acquiring the uh, cust- you know, large number of customers and keeping them and then having them use the service over and over again to do their work on an everyday basis. And the company was growing really fast. Everything was great. And then there was a technology glitch that happened just before I arrived there. And the company went from kind of owning its market and being dominant to quickly uh, having a real competitor. And the competitor posed a serious threat and limited the company's growth prospects. Like it was all, it was almost overnight that the, its prospects changed. And yet, um, because our company was owned by a paper company growing at like 2% a year, the growth that we were showing, despite facing all kinds of competitive issues, looked amazing relative to the paper company. And so um, it set me down this path of thinking, you know, how is it that it's okay to lose market share or have a big customer attrition problem, um, really change the, the value of your company for the worse? And you still get massively rewarded because you're earning, you know, you're, you're, you're generating current period earnings and you're, you're outgrowing the expectations of your owners. A couple of years later, I'm in business school and Fred Reichheld uh, publishes an article in the Harvard Business Review that just struck a chord. And I was like, that's, that is what happened. The article was about the, um, benefits of having high customer retention and the costs of having high customer attrition and translated that into economic value. And, you know, that and a few other factors kind of led me down this path of wanting to work at Bain with Fred Reichel. And um, here we are 30 something years later and, and I'm still doing that. It's amazing. I remember I used to work at a law firm and I set up there Lexus Nexus system. So I I know the system quite well. I think they're still probably pretty entrenched in uh, law firms, aren't they not? Yeah. I mean, it's a great company. They, you know, they continue to be successful, but I think that when um, you look at their history, there was this turning point where it would, it it is possible, like who knows what really would happen, but it is possible that they would have really dominated their market and maintained their very, very high share of a market they created. Um, but 
they made some choices about where to invest and about the the nature of their business that didn't really recognize the importance of satisfying and you know earning the loyalty of the customers that they had. It wasn't intentional. There was nothing. Um, you know, it, it just was a misunderstanding of the fundamental nature of their business that was probably driven a lot by the lenses through which people look at businesses, the accounting systems that we use to measure business success. So you created NPS, the Net Promoter System. Uh, can you explain to us what exactly is that? Um, well, t- to be clear, I did not create uh, the Net Promoter Score. And I was, you know, I was, I was part of the team that created the Net Promoter System. The Net Promoter Score was really an attempt to identify a single metric, a, a, you know, like the simplest possible way to figure out whether your customers are going to stay longer, buy more, tell their friends, be lower cost to serve, the things that drive customer lifetime value. And um, the beauty of the net promoter score is its simplicity. It's based on one question. It allows you to compare across customer and, and uh, you know, customer segments. When it's done as a competitive benchmark and done well, it allows you to compare the performance of different companies in an industry and predict their relative growth rates. So the score itself was quite powerful. The challenge that we ran into was that companies were just measuring their score and then hoping that suddenly, magically, they would become loyalty leaders. And um, I liken it to, you know, I want to get stronger. So instead of going to the gym, I go out and I buy a very, very expensive and very accurate tape measure. And every morning I get up and I measure the circumference of my biceps. And it's like, no, (laughs) you actually have to work out. You have to do the work. And so the system is really what's designed to help a large organization do the work. A large organization take feedback from individual customers, hand it to the individual employees in the organization who need to hear that feedback, follow up with customers whose feedback merits follow up, engage in learning and improvement to make the customer experience better. So it's it's a it's a set of business processes and rituals and habits and operations and analytics that enable an organization to put customer feedback to use in earning customer loyalty. Is this only for big companies or can it also be used for small to medium size? Any company can use it. Um, I say big companies because when you're a small company, like let's, you know, (laughs) Take it to its extreme. My grandfather, who who ran a um, wholesale meat company, like he knew every one of his customers. He spoke with the chefs who ordered the meat. He he knew their payment terms. Like all of them were familiar to him, and he had feedback from them. He, the owner, on a regular basis. Business as businesses get bigger the decision makers get further and further away from that day-to-day interaction with customers. It's not possible to know all the customers. It's not possible to see all the interactions. It's not possible to collect all of the feedback that they have on a regular basis. And as layers build up through an organization, it becomes harder and harder and harder. So while the basic um, elements of the net promoter system can be applied at any scale, I personally believe that the benefits are greatest when you reach a size where it's harder to, for decision makers, for leaders to have regular, uh, detailed information and, and contact with customers. Mm-hmm. Is the system primarily quantitative or is there also a qualitative component to it? Actually, the most important part of it is the qualitative. So a lot of people put too much emphasis, in my estimation, on the net promoter score. 
the likelihood to recommend that a customer gives when we ask them for their feedback. That simple score is telling because it gives you a general read on how happy or unhappy a customer is, how likely they are to stay longer, buy more, tell their friends. But the real gold comes from their reasons why. And in the net promoter system, what we do is instead of battering them with dozens and dozens of multiple choice questions in our framework for what we think they should want or need, we just open it up and we say, why? Tell me why you, why do you feel that way? And we let them use their own words, their own framework, whatever is on the top of their mind to, to point us to what really matters. And if they raise an issue that requires more, a deeper understanding, if they put something on the table, an idea, an opportunity that we need to learn more about, we just call them up and have a conversation with them. And we treat it like a dialogue. So that qualitative part, the interaction, the follow-up, is really, really the, the goal, the most important part of the feedback that we get. And I go back to this you know, issue, small company, it's a, you can read every piece of feedback. You can actually physically, one person can go through all of the feedback in detail. Uh, one person can do all the follow-up calls. In a large company, you have to actually collect that qualitative, you know, unstructured verbatims and, and comments and make sense out of it. So we use text analytics, we use sentiment analysis, we use other tools to sift through and find the patterns that emerge from the qualitative data and turn those into a somewhat quantitative version of qualitative feedback. So are you saying many people just use the net promoter score, but they often lack the more detailed qualitative that's associated with that? I think that um, too many, too many organizations, too many leaders, honestly, they, they, they want to, they want the easy magic pill. And so, oh, this net promoter thing, I know what that is. That's easy. And they say, go get that tell me what it is and, and tell me how, how good we are relative to everybody else. And they collect the score. They don't really pay a lot of attention to how they got the score. And then they say, well, what does that mean? And the poor folks in the organization have to go out and figure that out. And they come back and they say, well, we got a 68 and we looked it up on the internet and we found that other companies, you know, that's like, this is world-class. You say, world-class, what does that mean? Well, you know, from the Google search, I found, you know, that's really good. And, or even from this, um, this database, I found that this company produces on, you know, competitive net promoter scores. The problem with that is when you collect feedback from your own customers and they know it's you, and especially when you do it right after an interaction, um, your customer... The people who are, who are promoters are the ones who are most likely to respond, ones who had a good experience, actually. Surprisingly, a lot of people think that it's, it's the, the angry ones who respond. It's actually, you're more likely to spend your time giving feedback to a company you like. Um, you, and, and so, and there are people who, like a lot of customers want to be kind and they want to be kind to the people who served them. And so they also tend to, you know, give round up their scores a little bit. Um, so as a result, that score that you collect from your own customers with your own survey is not comparable to a score collected in another industry by a third-party research firm in a double-blind market research survey. It's just that the, the two methodologies are different. The respondents are different. There's just a ton of different ways that those things become incomparable so executives like they want to they want to just know give me the numbers tell me what they mean and i want to move on and unfortunately when you're trying to earn when you're trying to deliver more value to your customers than your competitors do, when you're trying to get better and better and better at serving them you can't just do that with a single number 
you got to actually dig in and understand what those customers' needs are, how they're actually experiencing doing business with you, what the pain points are, where the opportunities are to deliver value that they're not getting anywhere else. That doesn't come from, you know, one number. <laughs> Sorry. There's hard work there. You got to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and I think actually to be customer-centered, you have to keep up with changes because it's not always static, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's an evolving uh, thing that changes over time. Well, what customers want from you is a function not only of some kind of static and raw uh, underlying need, but it's also shaped by their experiences with other companies and other industries. It's shaped by what your competitors are doing. Like there is, the one thing you can be sure of is that customers are going to demand more from you tomorrow than they do today and that their standards are going to go up. When I was growing up, it was unusual to find a car that had an automatic transmission and uh, power windows. You had to spend more to get those. These days, you know, unless it's a, a certain type of car, it's hard to get a manual transmission. And show me the car, except for you know, like a little, couple of little go karty kinds of things that where you actually have to roll up the window with a manual crank. Customers would just puke all over that because the standards have changed over time, as they should, and that happens in every industry. You help companies become truly customer centric, but why do you think that most companies are not customer centric by default? Well, I think um, <laughs> you know, I think I think companies when they start are almost always customer centric. You know, when you're when you're an an insurgent in a new bit in a new industry, or you're you're a startup, you're working hard to figure out. You know, we talk about product market fit. We, you're working hard to figure out how to serve customers, how to differentiate, how to earn enough um, customer goodwill so that you can charge a premium. Like all those things you're, you're really focused on when you're starting. But as companies get bigger, as I said, the decision makers get further and further away from the, the front line, from the customer experience. They also have a set of filters and lenses through which they can see the business, most of which are derived from two basic structures. One is um, the functional and product-driven organization structure that we have. And the other is the uh, financial and management accounting practices that we engage in. So if you really think about it, you deal with um, lines of reporting and functional leaders and product leaders and so on. And you look at their performance through budgets and management reports. And unfortunately, in neither case is a holistic view of the customer really sitting in front of you. Um, I got my head of operations. And the head of operations is really focused on things like you know, making sure that I deliver on time, really making sure that we can answer the phones, making sure that our technology is working. I've got the head of, you know, this product line and they're really focused on the whiz bang new features and benefits they're rolling out or this new product launch that they're going to do or just their overall, you know, sales goals. And then even if I've got, you know, my sales team, my sales team has a certain incentive structure and a certain view of how they, they succeed. And they probably are the closest to having their eye on what customers need, but you know, they've got their own, their own set of lenses through which they view all of that. So there's really, it's, it's rare in, in big companies to have an easy way to see a, a kind of holistic view of the customer's experience, how they're feeling about you, how they feel about your competitors, what drives differences, and how they are, how those differences are then translating into their behavior, like repurchase rate or retention rate or 
you know, willingness to pay a price premium. And so it just, it becomes a, a sort of, abs- the, the customer is sort of an abstract construct viewed in statistical terms as averages. And um, you, you know, you're sort of trying to find the, the, the breadcrumbs of the customers through the P&L. The really customer-centric companies, like the ones that find ways to break through that t- often these days, are creating views of their customers' behavior and performance that is much more that are much more holistic. They're giving people the ability to see how, for example, cohorts of new customers acquired, you know, in a particular period of time, are performing relative to prior cohorts or to cohorts acquired through a different channel or on a different offer. They're providing views of the business based on. Um, how customers are experiencing specific journeys or episodes and how their changes in those episodes are impacting their buying habits and their retention and so on. And they make those readily available, not one-off. And they talk about them and they make that the focus of their discussion. Customer, the needs that they have, how we're fulfilling those and how those translate into the activities and and. Uh, actions that drive value for the business, not the revenue. And why did the revenue line go up or down? It's sort of bad, right? There's when companies that start with that, where they start with the P and L, or they start with the budget, and try to work backwards. I mean, they're 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 starting at a disadvantage. They're the framework they're using is not about the customers; it's about the company. Is there a company you can think of that's doing a great job of being customer centric? And what is it that they're doing that you know, that they're doing really well? I think there are a bunch of companies that are, um, you know, enduring loyalty leaders that consistently kind of knock it out of the park. I think Costco is a great example of a company that has remained customer centric for a, a long time. They have made a series of decisions over the years that run against common business thinking. So, for example, they were under tremendous pressure from analysts to raise the price of the rotisserie chicken at one point. And it's like, um, why? Well, because the cost of, of raw chicken went up. And the Costco leadership said, yeah, but this rotisserie chicken is kind of iconic for us. And it's an important thing for our customers. Um, There was, you know, typically there is pressure to uh, reduce the cost of a product. And you'll see like packaged goods companies will take a, a box of cereal and they'll keep the box the same size and they'll put a little less cereal in it. And they'll charge the same price. You know, Costco goes the opposite way. They have this, this smoked salmon. And if you look over the years at their smoked salmon, it's like, first it was kind of rough and uncut. Then it was sliced. Then the quality got a little better. Then at the same price, they started to add more salmon into the packaging. Like little by little, their salmon became better and better and better. And it's kind of, again, an iconic thing. Why? Because they're trying to deliver more value to their customers every year. And they have a framework for thinking about their business that says, if we deliver more value to our members, they will come back more. They will remain members longer. They will be more excited about doing business with us. You look at um, T-Mobile. T-Mobile was, you know, back in the day, also ran. And over the last, I don't know, decade, maybe a little less than that, they really turned things around. They, you know, they, they were the, they became the uncarrier and they did, they made a bunch of decisions that were short term profit negative. And analysts and investors were like, what are you doing? You're, you're giving away the, the store. But what they were doing was they were making decisions to make the business more of a good deal for customers and to treat customers the way that they would want to be treated themselves. Leaders would want to be treated themselves. And in doing so, they really turned around 
the reputation of T-Mobile. And, you know, they've gone from kind of a laggard on NPS in that industry to a leader. And the market, the market value of the company is just, you know, ballooned. So the, the, I, I, I could keep going, right? Like there's Vanguard, the mutual fund company is amazing. They're owned by their investors and they behave that way. So if a company wants to become more customer centric, what are the top three things they can do to become more customer centric? I'd say the first thing to do is make sure that you have a good handle on how you are delivering value for customers and how that compares to the alternatives they have in the market. So one way to do that would be to do a, you know, get a good read on your competitive benchmark net promoter score and the reasons why. You know, what is, how do we compare on an apples to apples basis with other companies that our customers or prospects could be buying from? What are the drivers of that? How does that, you know, what contributes to it? Is it, uh, to what extent is it product, functionality, price, brand, or elements of the customer experience? And which ones seem to be better here versus there? And by how much? And how much of the difference in likelihood to recommend, the difference in propensity to stay longer, buy more, tell your friends, is attributable to each of those drivers. That would be a, like just baseline starting. Where am I? Why? How does that translate into economic value? Second thing is to uh, take a customer lens to the business's economics. Actually have a, a, a mathematical model of your business and how it works that is grounded not in uh, product sales or in functional budgets, but instead is grounded in customer behavior, new customer acquisition, the behaviors and purchases of customers as they gain tenure, uh, cross sell, upsell, price realization, the drivers of the variable costs in the business traced back to customer behavior. And reorient the way you plan the business, the investments that you make, the trade-offs that you make around their impact on customer behavior and it's that, that behavior's impact on your P&L, not the other way. And then the third thing I would say is I would, I would want to create a way of infusing the entire organization with a steady drip of live customer feedback on the in, in the moments that matter from the customers that really need to be heard. And I would make sure that not only are you collecting and delivering that feedback to people, but that you've got the entire organization engaged in doing follow-up calls with customers to learn more, um, human-centered design exploration to dig into issues and problems and Really, you know, making customers' voices come to life through regular interaction with the customers and their feedback, rather than just through reports and analytics. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is these days, whether you're doing it or not, customers are going to be talking about you anyways, right? <laughs> On uh, social media and giving feedback. So uh, I think it's better to be a part of that conversation as opposed to just being an observer. I, I think what's fascinating is that I occasionally run into leadership teams who say, well, I don't want to ask those customers for feedback because I know they're angry. And it's like, okay, <laughs> do you think you're going to make them more angry by, by listening to them and letting them tell you what they, they would like, you know, or giving them a voice in how, how you serve them? And what's driving that? Is that just a fear of negativity or, uh, I think it's very human, Darshan, to, to not want to face into negative feedback, right? To not want to subject yourself to criticism and frustration. And I think that people shy away from conflict as, you know, there's good reason for that. Um, 
I, I just think that's human nature. Like there's nothing wrong with the, the, that impulse. But if you want to, if you want to be a really, really customer centric company, if you want to earn your customers deep and enduring loyalty, you got to treat it like a, a relationship you care about. You, you make a mistake, you apologize and you listen and you, you, you empathize. You have a customer who, for whatever reason, is upset. You try to learn more and give them an opportunity to help you help them. Yeah, oftentimes, those are the ones that really help you reshape something into a better product, isn't it? And that's where the kernels of insights sometimes come. Is And if someone actually gives you negative fear, they ought to care enough to tell you, right? Uh, as opposed to just not saying anything and walking away. This is why I say, um, you know, your promoters turn out to be the, the customers who give you the most value in the feedback. And it even turns out that when you're looking at detractors, like people who are really upset with you, there are two types of detractors. They're probably more than that, but the two big ones. Um, one are promoters who are disappointed. People who actually love you. They want to love you. And they feel like they've been betrayed or disappointed or unheard. Those, I mean, you can turn that around real quick if you give them an opportunity to talk to you and if you pay attention to them instead of hiding from them. Now, there's another type who have pretty much given up on you or they really aren't the right customer for your business model. Like they have needs that you will never meet. That's a different issue. There, I think you got to be careful about overreacting to feedback from that group. Um, and I think one of the one of the the areas of management judgment that's most important is deciding which customers you're going to listen closest to, whose needs you're going to fill, even if it comes at the expense of some other customer, because you have to make choices with limited resources, and. Um, I, you know, the, the art of all of this is understanding uh, when you're getting feedback from a customer who just is not a fit with your business model, to, how to kind of let that go. Tell us more about the Peter Drucker quote, the true purpose of a business is to create and keep customers. Well, let's face it, um, the value of a business is the value of its customer relationships. Every dollar that you earn somehow starts out in a customer's pocket. And if you want to earn more money, then you've got to deliver enough value to customers that they are happy to hand over money to you for making their life better. So in, in that way, I think Peter Drucker just captured it perfectly. The, the, the real purpose of an organization, of a, of a company, the real purpose of, of a leader, of an individual, really is grounded in making other people's lives better. And in doing so, earning their trust and earning a right to ask them for something in return, which they willingly give because you gave them so much value. Like that's the contract in a free economy. And I think it's really easy to kind of get all caught up in the, the details of a business and forget that at the end of the day, the reason you are able to charge something for your products and services is because they make your customers' lives better. Make it easier, less costly, faster, more pleasurable to do business or to live your life. And that's, how, that's why customers pay you. Is being customer centric even more important now than before? And if so, why? Well, there was never a time when uh, being customer centric wasn't important. I think that so many more companies have awakened to the need to satisfy customers' desires and have developed capabilities for doing so that the bar has been raised. I think that more companies are paying attention to 
customer feedback. The pace of innovation is unending and, uh, you know, accelerating as it has been for as long as I've been alive. And I think that if um, you think that you can build a business without worrying about, you know, your customers and how you're making their lives better, I mean, maybe you can find a way to succeed for some period of time, but that is not, that is not going to be an enduring success. You know, we talk about value and I think there's many components to value, right? Saving time, saving money, making something easier. But it seems another component that's become more and more important is the experience you deliver. And it seems people are often even now buying uh, products based on experience and not just the product itself. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there are three different sources of value, like fundamental sources of value that people pay for. They pay for rational value. That is features, benefits at a, at a price. They pay for experiential value, which is how does it feel to do business with this company and how easy or hard is it? And how pleasurable is that? And then they pay for what I would call emotional value. Um, In many cases, that is an emotional connection with the brand or a sense of uh, aligning yourself with the purpose. Um, You know, think Tom's Shoes, which is a purpose-driven example of a a company. Those those three um, dimensions of value, if you will, are all working together at any given point in time. And I think there's some companies that operate more on one of those dimensions than others. So, you know, I just bought a, an airline ticket on Spirit Airlines and it's pretty impressive how many different ways they can find to charge you fees for things that you are built into the, the price of other airline tickets. So their initial price is really, really low. And then everything you, you do seems to have a fee associated with it. Well, they're working on rational value, like almost exclusively. I look at, you know, Southwest, which is also a low cost carrier, but they work a lot on emotional value. They, the connection that you have an experiential value, the connection that you have with their flight crew and the way that you board the plane, which is a very orderly way of boarding the plane and it's very low stress. The fact that they don't charge for bags is part of their rational value that goes along with that. So it's like um, experience is all, has always been an integral part of how people think about the value they're getting. I think companies recently didn't put as much weight on experience, didn't know how to think about it, didn't have structured ways to design it and measure it and operate differently to deliver better experiences. And so um, depending on what your business model is, uh, the, you know, the bar is rising on experience. It's, it's harder and harder to be differentiated there because so many companies have awakened to the need to operate in that, that value dimension. Mm-hmm. What area of becoming customer centric would you like to delve into more and why? I, I don't know how to answer that question. I just, I want to, you know, I, I'm interested in every dimension of customer centricity. The thing that fascinates me, the thing that I've always, always, always wondered about and, and been curious about is, the barriers to making customer-centric decisions, the things that get in the way of delivering more value to customers, even though we as leaders know they're the right things to do. You know, the, the tendency to cut uh, headcount in the contact center or in stores when you get into a bad quarter, even though you know that it's going to drive up waiting time and it's going to reduce the service levels, the tendency to impose higher fees and nuisance fees to generate more revenue, even though you know it's going to enrage some portion of your customer base. I'm fascinated by 
by how those decisions keep creeping back into companies, even after they've wiped them out. It's like Groundhog Day in some of these companies. Um, so I, I want to know why. I, I, I'm, I continue to be curious and to learn every day a little bit more about what makes it hard to be customer-centered. Is it as simple as just taking more of a long-term view versus a short-term view? It would be if people thought that they could keep their jobs by just focusing on the long-term. And I think that we, we live in an environment, a business environment, where um, long-term it has a, it is actually a very short period for, for many leaders. Um, You've got the problem of quarterly earnings expectations from investors. You've got the challenge of what are called vulture investors or activist investors who will demand a change in leadership if you're not delivering in the near term. You've got the challenge that investors don't have a good window into the long-term value being created in a customer base because of the conventions we have around um, uh, disclosure and accounting. So there, there are just a lot of um, a lot of things that that make being a long-term focused leader difficult in today's business environment. And and one piece of evidence of that is that of the, this, this is from maybe two or three years ago, a piece of analysis I did, of the companies that lead their industry in NPS, somewhere around 60% or two-thirds of them are owned by their customers, uh, owned by their founder, or otherwise controlled by the founder or the founder's family. That is striking. Right, that it, the, the majority of the companies that lead in their industries, lead on loyalty in their industries, meaning that have a long-term focus on earning customer relationships, are not publicly traded or um, you know subject to, say, a, a activist investor coming in and forcing a short-term focus. Interesting. That's quite interesting. In the world of customer centric and customer insights, who would you love to have lunch with and why? <laughs> uh, I think Jim Cynical, the uh, you know, the the former CEO of Costco, sounds like a fascinating guy I never met, but I would really like to get a chance. I I had the chance to um spend a little bit of time with Herb Kelleher from Southwest fascinating guy um and i would you know if if he were still alive i would i would want to spend more time with him um i'm really fascinated by uh amazon and the powerhouse that they are in terms of you know they talk about being customer obsessed i don't know if jeff bezos is the guy that i would want to have lunch with but there's somebody there or some set of people there who really really get it and I am just fascinated by how they continue to do that. I wish Walt Disney were around for me to spend time with because I'd love to learn a little bit about the vision that he had for the, the mm -hmm. theme parks. Yeah. Yeah, they certainly deliver an experience and they've been very successful delivering consistently. Well, this has been great. I really enjoyed talking to you, Rob. Thank you for all the uh, insights and knowledge uh, related to Net Promoter Score and being customer-centric. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was a, an enjoyable conversation. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening.